AFL staff and athletes. My name is Jack McLean, and today I'm lucky enough to have our guest as Gareth Sanford. Our key topic for today's chat will be all about conditioning for AFL squads as well as field-based athletes to maximise their performance. And I'm really looking forward to diving in. Make sure if you have any questions you're tuning in live to send them through, uh, whether you're a high-performance staff or footballer, more than happy to uh, answer your questions. But welcome, Gareth. Thanks for jumping on, mate. Really looking forward to our chat. Thanks, Jack. Glad we uh, finally got this one on the books. Thanks for your yeah, patience. Well no, no I'm, uh, patience, persistence pays, and yeah, this is definitely a, a platform that I think will be um, a highly topical sort of conversation in terms of conditioning. Um, there's probably, a, a, as we've discussed off air, there's a real trend in the industry lately I mean, in terms of high intensity and probably not paying enough attention to the aerobic side, and obviously all aspects of energy system development is key, um, particularly for sports like AFL where it's such a long game. But um, for those that aren't aware of your background, no doubt, most listeners will be, mate, but um, do you mind providing a bit of a background in, in I guess, how you started the industry, um, where your passion sort of started for it, and um, yeah, different places you've worked as well as um, uh, where you've studied and, and the like. Yeah, sounds good. Well, welcome everyone who's joining live. Great to, great to have you all here. Um, if you have a question throughout, please uh, drop something in the chat. Let us know. Let us know what you have on your mind. So, yeah, by way of introduction, I'm originally from the UK and um studied undergrad masters at loughborough university did some um initial experience in high performance sport at chelsea football club back in the 2010 era when carlo ancelotti was head coach there um and then did some sprints coaching um both in the uk the us and in india a bit of snc bits there too so real insight into that side of things and in about, it was 2015, I moved out to New Zealand. And that's where my interest in this combined area of speed and endurance together in a program really came to the fore. And I worked in the New Zealand high performance sport system there, uh, specializing in 800 meter running and the training science of that. And during that time, I spent six and a half months on the road, visiting lots of coaches around the world who are training athletes who have very much endurance dominant type profiles, but also speed type profiles within the same squad. And sat down with each of them, tested, profiled, and looked at, hey, how are they getting this athlete to their best performance when they present with totally different qualities to someone else at the other side of the spectrum? And after that, my work kind of extended out into team sports. So worked with the English football team for four years um, in a consulting role around profiling and then how do we maximize repeat and recover performance. So if we think of, you know, when you get to the um, AFL grand finals type, type stage, you've got four weeks there where it's all on. How do we get players to repeat and recover and be at their best at the end of that? Um, and so now today, uh, well, I've spent the last five years in the Canadian sports system, um, working with track and field, triathlon, but also doing a lot of consulting with teams. So English football, Gaelic football, um, yourself at Melbourne uh, in the AFL, and uh, really specializing in that intersection where speed and endurance are both needed. And not just that, but where a squad has a lot of variability, right? players who need something different to maximize their physiology. And so that applies in a performance sense, in a coaching team sense, but also all the way down to your return to play and reconditioning and everything in between. I think, geez, what a great range of uh, experiences and, and different athletes you've worked with over your time. No doubt that there have been some strong influences um, during that time who who have you sort of, um, who have, whether it be mentored or just people that have influenced you along the way, um, including athletes, but of course staff as well, who have been some strong influences of your, your philosophy, Gareth? Yeah, lot, lots of different people. The first uh, one would be Nick Broad, who was the head of science at Chelsea Football Club. Um, and then uh, Dr. Angus Ross, now in New Zealand, more speed power physiology. So Nick had a nutrition background, Angus speed power physiology. And then uh, on the endurance side, you know, many people like Trent Stellingworth, good example, um, Steve Magnus, 
Um, and then, you know, on the sprint side of things, Coach Dan Paff, Stu McMillan. So lots of different people and learn a lot from a lot of coaches as well um, in the sort of middle and long distance space as well as, as team sports. Yeah. Yeah. And no doubt some highlights, what are sort of some moments um, that sort of spring front of mind that you're most proud of? Yeah, I'd say the the Round the World Tour was probably the highlight of all of those just because you're condensing almost years of learning and engagement into a six-month period. You know, worked with over 80 coaches during that that trip and so your rate of learning is really quick. You learn a lot of what not to do quite quickly and, um, yeah, a lot of good good questions to ask. So, yeah. We'll, we'll dive straight into the topic um, uh, and probably a great way to start is just to provide a bit of clarity around some of these key terms that we're, we're about to discuss um, sure. and no doubt you'll reference throughout. So I guess to start with speed endurance, how would you sort of define speed endurance for, for the listeners, I guess, thinking of high performance stuff but also yeah. for the athletes tuning in as well? Yeah, so speed endurance would be all-out efforts of kind of in that 15 to 20-second duration with an aim of getting a really high peak lactate to really tax that anaerobic energy system. So we might do those to um, improve the amount of energy we can produce anaerobically. Mm -hmm. And then maximal aerobic speed? Yeah, so maximal aerobic speed is, a, I guess, a, a term that's developed in the field with an aim of eliciting that internal load of VO2 max. So it's a speed estimate. That equates to a pace that would, if we ran at that pace, would be taxing our VO2 max uh, stimulus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's different, maybe just to clarify, like in the lab, you would have velocity at VO2 max. Yep. And the difference between the two is in the lab, you would have the gas analysis. So in the field, it's always an estimate. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's generally that sort of six minute to eight minute test. What's your yeah, favorite? Typically like around two K's that. popular in football, but. Yeah, around that six-minute mark is around where most people can typically sustain that pace. If you did an all-out effort, mm -hmm. you could probably run at VO2 max pace for around six minutes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I guess that's that just depends on the type, on the level of athlete, so age of athlete that you're working with, um, potentially gender as well. So if it, if you're doing a two K time trial and it takes it's taking the group ten minutes you'd probably change your distance, would you, to like a 1,200 or? Yeah, exactly. So there's some some nice work in the AFL um, from, I think it's uh, Clint Bellinger, who looked at the time trial on the men's side, which landed 2K was around the six-minute mark. And on the women's side, I think uh, 1,500 in distance got them to a similar spot of of duration so yeah you're absolutely right you would want to adjust that slightly yeah. uh, and probably the next two popular terms will be uh, critical speed yeah yeah so critical speed is um the last sustainable pace where you're you're almost exclusively working aerobically so your heart rate your breathing your blood lactate your perception of effort are stable at this pace when you move beyond it, you transition from that steady physiology into non-steady physiology. So when you're underneath and at that critical speed pace, your fatigue cost is much less, right? Your recovery is much better from that type of workout, and you're really limiting the amount of anaerobic energy sources that are contributing to the workout. It isn't zero but it is a lot less. Once you start going above that critical speed towards that MAS or VO2 max intensity, that's when you start recruiting more fast twitch muscle to do the work, right? That's when you start producing more and more lactate the longer you sustain an effort. And so that's where that you want that distinction in your, your training between those two items. Yeah, so in terms of yeah, less fatigue, would um, critical speed training be something like quite useful to use early in the week, maybe plus two from game day, if you were to do some conditioning and the athletes are still recovering from the game or, or how, yeah, how do you sort of fit that in your week when, for in-season athletes, I guess? 
Yeah, in season, I think those two days post a game is a great place for it. I think a, a general observation I would I would make is that I think a lot of people actually overvalue or overestimate the cost of recovering from critical speed because when it's executed correctly, the recovery cost is low. Almost could and be if, active recovery, do you think, or a little bit? Yeah. The athlete. Yeah. yeah, I think you could blend that low and moderate because we do want to have a distinction between those two things as well, right? Sure. Um, but yeah, I think if it's controlled well, and what does controlled well mean? Well, that would be anchoring it in a five or six out of 10 effort. Mm -hmm. It would be a heart rate range of typically in that 83 to 87% of heart rate max. It would be a blood lactate in that 2.8 to three and a half millimole type range. And so you can look at all those things with monitoring during the effort. You can also look at when the athlete stops. Because when an athlete stops doing a critical speed effort, immediately they should be able to talk to you. If they stop the effort and they're hyperventilating and they can hardly speaking, speak to you and their breathing's out of control, then they're working too hard, right? They're now not in that steady state physiology. So these are all clues where, you know, you have your anchoring pace as a starting point. So maybe just to explain that. You can estimate your critical speed as a percentage of that VO2 max. If that's only step one, right? That'd be like so 80% or... the percentage range it could sit at would be yeah. maybe 80 to 95% of that MAS pace, right? As your starting point. So if somebody hasn't done critical speed before, you'd be saying, okay, let's have our 2K time trial and our MAS estimate. Then we're going to calculate 80% of that. That gives us a pace. That gives us a pace to go, okay, in the session that we're going to do, which I, I like this kind of session, 16 by a minute on, a minute off. 12 to 16 is a good range as a starting point to go, okay, let's do this pace for a minute on, a minute off. And we're going to see what the response is. And it oh, should be all of those straight. things. 16 reps, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because the work of critical speed, the adaptation from critical speed is at the back end of that workout. You know, the real adaptation comes in reps 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And typically in team sport, we're not as used to larger volumes of those type of workouts because we're normally doing max aerobic speed or high intensity. Yeah, right. It's hard to get thirty minute time slots with the yeah with the athletes. Yeah, completely. And those those are things too. And that's where like the day after a game, what a player's doing. You know, there's a real opportunity there to say, okay, well, let's cool down. Let's sorry, let's do something that's low intensity with maybe some moderate intensity pickups into that critical speed pace. There you can find, you know, 30, 40 minutes maybe of a session where maybe 15 to 20 minutes of that is critical speed, right? Then we can also look throughout the week and say, okay, when do we have players in the gym, right? What are we doing pre and post? Can we tag on some minutes there? When we warm up, what does our warm up jog look like? Does it look like plodding? Or could there be a couple minutes of a bit more intent in the warm up? And quite quickly there, you're stacking minutes on top of minutes every day. And this is the thing about the aerobic system is it needs more stimulation than I think most people recognize, like regularly. And if you let it go, you detrain really quick. So an analogy I like to think of is that the low and moderate intensity is like putting deposits in a bank account. Whereas when you go above that critical speed and you're now into that non-steady state physiology, it's like making withdrawals. And withdrawals are appropriate at certain times. And you get a short-term boost from them, but you have to recognize the cost of what that's going to be. 
And so we do want to make withdrawals throughout the season. We do want to utilize max aerobic speed. And of course, we playing a game is like making withdrawals as well. But we we want to do that strategically because if we make withdrawals without a bank account, what happens, right? That's when pl players feel flat or maybe they're at risk of injury. They go stale, right? And so the balance, the dance of conditioning is this interplay between deposits and withdrawals of the bank account. And as a as a plan, as a team, you want to be strategically periodizing those deposits and withdrawals to really to be on for that grand final phase, right? Because it's no good getting to that time and going, okay, well, we've made it, right? We we, we we've qualified, but we've our bank accounts are empty. Right. And so when I look at a training plan, I'm all over where are those things carrying between weeks, right? What is our normal for these things in terms of minutes? And are we carrying that stimulus through? Because often when we run into trouble in the conditioning sense, we'll go, oh, um, players are blowing. Yeah, yeah. Let's add yeah. more intensity. Mm. But the most common reality I see is that that's not the thing that they need. You're seeing the output of an empty bank account. Yeah. Yeah. Whether they're detrained or you've just exhausted them. Yeah. 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 So that's a general frame that I think is really crucial for teams as they move through the season, you know, even when you come into pre-season, right? Mm -hmm. Like what's the aim of pre-season? Building that bank account. <laughs> right. But what do we often start with? Yeah. Maybe there is some low intensity in there, right? But is critical speed a training item? Oh, no. Yeah. It's all probably moderate. To right? So when you say yeah, low to moderate, are you talking about so low critical speed work, that 80% of the, MAS or VO2, and then moderate is that yeah, around hundred percent of MAS or or critical critical speed included of that. Critical yeah. speed is your moderate. Yeah. High intensity is your MAS or speed endurance, your VO2 and max above. or speed endurance. Yeah. yeah. Your sprinting speed because it's limited by technique and force and not energy system mm -hmm. is almost that's a different strain. You know, it's not the same energy system strain. It's more a neuromuscular mechanical strain. So acceleration, deceleration, sprinting speed would go into that bucket. Most sort of hill work or strength training would go in that bucket. How does that impact the bank account? Well, that's a that's an interesting question. I think it's kind of, a again, a dance where while you're training low and moderate, because you're not getting into a lot of that space where you're going super anaerobic in terms of really high lactate, it actually means you're fresher, right? To do that acceleration, deceleration, sprinting speed work, which means actually you can get better inroads of doing that while you're making deposits, right? And these are the things that create the scaffolding. You know, like one of the important things is the repeat and recover demands right of of afl and you know with that in mind the acceleration deceleration sprinting speed and the ability to recover from those repeated efforts that's the scaffolding that holds everything up then you have the specific work right of actually doing the repeated efforts but on the physical preparation side, it's those physical capacities that are the scaffolding for that. And it's when that falls away that the sport-specific stuff becomes a lot harder because the energy system and the physical capacities are creating the, the, uh, the room, let's say, to make withdrawals and it not totally deplete us, right? And so that's the dance. Oh, yeah, going back to the critical speed, so that workout 
of like one minute on, one minute off, and you and you, yeah. know, you haven't got a lab access, so you're sort of getting a feel for where the athlete, what their critical speed is, because I imagine that changes depending on the athlete's fitness level. Um, do you did that one that you mentioned how they feel after that workout and talking to them if they can talk um, straight away comfortably, and you did eighty percent, would you then next time in a week's time let, let's do it at eighty five percent to see if they can talk after and then you know, build them towards 90% to get an, an idea of what their speed is. And that's something that is a way of testing, I guess, their critical speed. Yeah, all of it is, okay, let's, we have an estimate of pace of what we think this is going to be. And then we're looking at the response, right? To see, does it elicit that five or six out of 10 effort? Is it hitting the feeling of the physiology that we want to tackle? And I think that specifically is a, is a really important point because you know there's a good story of Jeff Bezos from Amazon and he talks about how we have to be really careful about what we're optimizing training to like optimizing things towards like what metrics drive what we do and of course the 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 GPS metrics are really useful right they've taken the sport on to a different direction but there is a pendulum swing right we're almost now everything is driven by those external metrics, right? Have we got enough high speed running or whatever that is? That's a real issue when it comes to the critical speed and low intensity stuff, because it should be effort based and feeling based. So the pace will be what it needs to be to, el to elicit the feeling. If that means I need to dial back the pace today, because when we do this rep, you're, you're starting to breathe too hard, then that's what I need to do, right? So I don't have, with the aerobic conditioning side of things, I don't have too fixed a mindset on it has to be this pace. It's more the pace will be what it's going to be. Yeah. It's going to be the pace that gives us the response. And the, the idea of the session is to refine and turn the dial on getting that response. And I think sometimes that, you know, we, in sports science, we get so caught up in, are we doing the right test, right? How many of these should we do? What should the work to rest be? And I think we've moved away from what adaptation are we trying to get? And in the moment, are we actually measuring, understanding, and adapting the workout based on delivering that? adaptation we want to try and achieve and you know if you pick a thousand meters high speed running as an external metric well that means different things for different athletes as a stimulus that we're giving them but often the conversation is oh yeah we we achieved those high speed running metrics therefore we got what we needed and i think that's a disconnect sure yeah and when when facilitating the first critical speed perhaps with a, with a training group um, that hasn't done that work before, um, yep. so educating them about um, the five to seven, um, how would you explain that to the athletes? I imagine like, a, like a, let's say an AFL athlete that's quite used to doing high intensity conditioning all the time, go, yep. go, go, push, push, push. Um, if you ask a five to seven, they're, they're going to work relatively around MAS plus probably in that yeah. first minute. Um, yeah, and try, try and work themselves. And then a minute walk, they might challenge that as well, like feeling like they don't need the minute walk, for example. So what would be some sort of educational aspects to, for, to the athlete? Uh, yeah, so I think there's this? a couple of items. You know, one is that I think with the wave of high intensity, there's a feeling that if I'm not doing something that doesn't feel hard, it's not benefiting me. And that couldn't be further from the reality what you really need is you need balance you need light and shade in your program if every day you're trying to go high intensity then if we come back to our fitness bank account analogy what are you doing you're making withdrawals every day right so at no point do you actually build fitness a throughout the season b across seasons and I have conversations in my consulting with loads of practitioners where the conversation is, yeah, I've been at a club for X number of years and I'm not sure we're moving players on 
season after season. And I think this is a lot of the reason why, right? Because we feel that we're time poor and we are. But I mean, quite quickly, we found their 40 minutes of space without really having to search to find opportunities to put critical speed in the program, right? So in terms of teaching, I think a good place to start is actually off feet. Do you have Chain bikes mode. at your, yeah, at your yeah. club? Yeah, 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 sure. So I think a really nice way to do it, and you might have to divide your squad up, is to have everyone on bikes, right? And you five or six out of 10 effort, right? 83 to 87% of your max heart rate. And you can walk up and down and you can hear people's breathing. Okay, you're working too hard. You're working too hard. Dial it back. And it might be you're adjusting the resistance. Because that feeling translates to when you go to the run. And what you might do is you start, you know, maybe the low end of critical speed at 83%, and then you work through and you find the edge. You find the edge. And you and and you let everyone feel, oh yeah, now you're working too hard. That's what it feels like. That's what we don't want. Then you dial it back. And you'd be surprised how subtle a two to three second adjustment in running, or you know, a fraction of an adjustment in the resistance on a on a bike can actually bring that perception back down. And so that's for me is where, you know, as practitioners, we really want to be getting to is, are we executing the session right for the intent, for the adaptation we're trying to do? And then can we do it consistently, right? Because you can't even get to the consistently bit till you're learning to do it right. So I think it starts there. Now, that might sound like a lot, but hey, very quickly, you start stacking those together, like after session two, session three, yep, we know, we know what it is, we know what it should feel like. Yep. Yep. Right? And you have the in the moment checks, and then you have the post session checks where you can look at, okay, oh, they they actually turned the dial up to 85% of their MAS this week. But when we look at the heart rate trace, it's stable. Right? So you've got the in the moment and you've got the the other piece too. And, and that becomes important for the individualization bit because, you know, one of the risks of this type of work is that you set one pace for the top of the group and then everyone does that pace, yeah. right? So then you get the boys at the back are working harder than critical speed. Boys at the front, they're doing, they're doing fine. That seems okay as a one-off, but if that happens every day, you've now got some people that were building the bank account when you thought they were, and others that you thought that were building the bank account but were working too hard. So in fact, they weren't building the bank account, and that will really hurt you later in the season. Yeah, no, thanks yeah. for that. That's um, like you said, it, it's something that you've. I mean, you're consulting a lot of teams. It seems to be the missing link um, with high performance teams due to probably those valid reasons, time and, and things like that. But like anything, yeah. if, if you value it, you can make time for it and, and, and it's flexible with the mode. So if the boys are maybe they're plus two and it was a heavy run and you haven't got a lot of tickets to use for the week for, for running, you want to maximise football, you can you can revert to the bike. And then other days where you have maybe a nine-day break, 10-day break or a bye week, you can start to transfer that to, to running. Um, so there's, a, there's still value in, in obviously changing the mode, even though it's off legs, it's not, Specific to, to running, you feel um, that will hold on. You you won't have that detraining effect across the season with a yeah. with a training squad like AFL when you use the bike. Yeah, yeah. I also think when you look at the um, you know the physical contact side of the game, as well as the you know axel D cell piece, particularly the D cell piece that has a lot of breaking forces and a lot of muscle damage piece, like where you can offload people, I would be doing that. Yeah. And yep. particularly when you want to start um, building the volume out. So to give some idea of what is a typical amount of critical speed that people would do, 
So if we start from this lens that players in AFL need to maximize both speed and endurance, but they have a di every player has a different balance as to their relative strengths in both those areas, right? That same physiology presents in almost any team sport and it presents in middle distance running. So there's one bit here of training where in terms of the physical profile of the athletes, we need to assess that actually outside of the sport context and put the numbers of players in a sport relative to the population of athletes that could present with both speed and endurance. So maybe just as an example for the group, we've got a really nice uh, example here of some different profiles in AFL. So this is a collaboration with uh, Coach Coach Edmonds. So shout out to shout out to him. But here we got Charlie Cameron, a good example of a speed profile. So we can explain what we mean by a speed profile i'll just start at the beginning here so we can use something called the anaerobic speed reserve which is the speed range from the maximal aerobic speed which we spoke about just a bit earlier through to the maximal sprinting speed and that range if you plot those two landmarks across your group so your six minute or 2k time trial in your sprinting speed you essentially get a spread of differences within your group Right, so some people that are very speed oriented, some that have a good balance of both, and some that are more endurance dominant. So here are some player examples of that. So we got Charlie Cameron, a sprinting speed there, that would be around just approaching 10 meters a second. We've got a hybrid profile, so someone who's very good, both on the endurance side and both on the sprinting side. Again, this, this sprinting speed is north of 10 yeah. meters a second. And then we got Sam Walsh averaging, you know, in one particular season here, 15, 15 Ks in a game. So every squad has got these wide range of player physiology that exist, whether they're playing AFL, whether they're playing hockey, whether they're playing basketball, whether they're playing soccer. So we need to understand that physiology balance within our squad and then we put that in context of what are the demands that an AFL game offers. But what I often see, and this is a real tension for a lot of people, is should we train the sport-specific elements or should we train the physical capacities underpinning the sport? And so it can tend to be this binary thing, right, where people maybe over-insulate themselves in one of those two buckets. And the reality is you want both of those things and they both have to be present all of the time. You know, your physiology does not know what sport you're playing. The aerobic system just knows if it's being stimulated or not. And if it's detraining and gone, then, you know, that's, that's when we see those things. So that's a good frame for, you know, maybe, maybe moving into talking about individualization a little bit but you know these are the broad spectrum of all of the types of physiology you might see in your squad so this is not another model that is looking at one part of the table this is the spread of the physiology that will exist in your team and it may be that you go okay well actually we we don't have anyone who's 10 meters a second sprinting speed most of our people are over here well that's really useful information around how we might individualize and sort of redirect the emphasis of our conditioning program because if you think about you know you have those opportunities in the week for conditioning which are limited but you also have the tactical technical training that's happening every day and there's a implication cost for whether you're speed hybrid or endurance of that stimulus it's not received the same by everybody and so we want to be looking at that individual response to the day-to-day -day training as much as the individual conditioning so it works in both scenarios so 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Gareth. It's um, I think a yeah, great visual, and, and make sure if you're listening in to follow Gareth's Instagram, as there's some some um, yeah good ways of of just providing a bit more clarity on these terms for those that are listening. Sometimes you just need a visual uh, to see it. Yeah. Um, go, go yeah. with those three groups um, that you had there, like you mentioned, that you might not have an athlete that is what what we classify as speed in terms of you know comparing them to a high performing athlete like for a male it's 10 and maybe for females it's around nine minutes per second but is it all relative to the sport a little bit too like do you almost look at your data points and say well yeah he's not getting 10 meters per second but he's our fastest guy so we're going to treat him like a speed athlete or is that not the case do you feel like you need to look at benchmarks for genders and yeah how do you sort of tackle that yeah i think what you just highlighted is one of the uh potential biggest mistakes that happens is we look at our squad and go who's the fastest in our squad mm. oh they must be speed and one of the challenging things you know maybe just to bring the example up again is that you know if we look at charlie cameron as a sprinting speed and i should state that this data is sort of publicly available so can't uh, be 100 percent on the degree of accuracy but let's say it's from you know the um like stadium capture type of type insight. So Charlie Cameron speed profile. I don't have the information on his, um, his endurance side, but performance coach Edmonds who helps people with, uh, with this kind of training gave this suggestion as a, as a speed profile. Yep. Then we got Bradley Hill. You notice that his sprinting speed is actually higher than what we got for Charlie. But the fact that he also yeah. has a decent, Speed test score is the thing that makes him a hybrid, right? So something that's going to present early on is the sprinting speed. But the mistake that can happen is that if someone isn't exposed to aerobic training, they don't get the chance to really express that aerobic quality they do have. And these hybrid athletes, these are the real special ones, right? Because they have qualities in both sides of the table. I think the type of question we want to be asking is, you know, if we've got sprinting speeds of 10 meters a second, how is someone getting to their sprinting speed? And what about so the, some people, um, the ASR? Do you, do you create those groups just using the ASR as the, as the number? Yeah, we'd look at that. We'd look at that uh spread yes but then we'd also compare these absolute amounts right so we know that a speed person is probably going to be around 10 meters a second in that sprinting speed then we look at the independent mas marker and go okay well where does that sit so someone who is you know a sprinting speed or sorry a speed profile they might only be in the let's say 16 17 k's an hour in a team sport space mm -hmm. But someone who's a hybrid can probably get into that 18, 19 space, right? And then someone who is more endurance is going to be much more in that around the 20 time mark in terms 20 Ks an hour in terms of that MAS, but with a sprinting speed of probably nearer to 30-ish, yeah. you know, Ks an hour. So you can see we have this sort of light and shade in the in the balance across the squad. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily like from a practical point of view as well, when you're running, typically you, you have your windows in a, in a session um, and they'll be in and around conditioning. Sometimes it's at the end, sometimes it's throughout training. So the flow of sessions, obviously really, really important. Um, yep. to, you know, you've got um, 45 athletes, let's say, um, and you've yep. got five speed athletes in, in the truest form and you've got 30 aerobic and the rest are hybrid. Do you do you break up or do you create an extra group to help with the logistics of it all or yeah and, and yeah so some good examples like you you might be listening to this and going okay well this sounds nice but I've got forty five in my squad and how do I do this well I think most people are pretty good at individualizing in the moment mm. you know so you turn up at a session and go okay well you had a hard day yesterday or we know you're more explosive okay we're going to back this off slightly but i think there's a better way forward here and that is instead of writing 45 individual plans is to have a speed plan 
a hybrid plan and an endurance plan and your hybrid plan is probably a crossover of a mix and match of the two because the risk with hybrid profiles is because they're good in both areas they can get pulled too far in both areas um and so then in terms of logistics you know colleagues in the english premier league would have you know pitch setups for three different groups so i think it becomes a planning piece yep. um because you're right you don't have long so you want the time that you have to be what they need and of course there's going to be nuance and individualization within those groups but most people i think are good at doing that anyway in the moment so what we're talking about is just having a bit more of a maybe comprehensive strategy around doing that and being deliberate with okay what would an endurance prescription look like for this what would a speed prescription look like for this and then you know these are continuums right so you're going to have some people that are either side of that hybrid in the middle yep. so we want to start with that broadly and then as we talked about with critical speed and this applies across all stimulus is be in there and this is where you get to innovate right what are we seeing hey so and so is adapting real quick to this okay now it's your job to really be moving them on rather than okay well we're going to do this for six weeks and then this for six weeks and then the next thing for six weeks you know because people have different time course of adaptation on these things and you know i think once you've been in a structured program for you know let's say between three and five years you're really going to start getting saturated let's say for those baseline qualities and it becomes more and more about who are you what is your individual signature and then are we stimulating you given those are the qualities that you have so for example in the last year i worked with two athletes that would present with 10 meters a second speed one of them was a true speed profile they got to their speed by having a lot of fast twitch so every, anything long and continuous became very anaerobic right then we had a hybrid athlete who was very neural they could activate really quickly and they had really long hamstrings so they got to their speed by being able to activate really quick but also having long muscle fascicle lengths that can shorten really quick and have a fast shortening velocity so those two qualities in that hybrid athlete meant that they also had the physiology template to adapt very well aerobically right and so you have two athletes on paper very similar sprinting speed but when you dive deeper the nuance in their physiology is very different and so with the speed that's probably going to be the thing that shows up first we then want to be with training exposing people to the critical speed to low intensity to vo2 max and capturing what those responses are right because then that leaves clues around people's individual signature that's what we need to be pursuing and chasing the output of that will be whatever the external metric needs to be and there is a time for the sport specific stimulus and we can maybe get to that but like how much is enough is it a common question and the answer to that question is well enough to continue to be stimulating from where you are so if we take critical speed what you did in the last six weeks is really going to determine how you how you're going to respond to a critical session speed session today so let's say your normal is 20 minutes in a session or let's say 40 minutes a week right if we go next week and we do 30 minutes well that's 10 less than what our normal is so if we go too many weeks now where our normal is 30 rather than 40 we've started to detrain that quality whereas if we're starting to, from zero and we build up to 20 
or 30 next week, that's a pro that's enough to be stimulating it more. Yeah. Right? Now, with the time constraints in team sports, you start with building the volume. You've just got to accumulate time. There's like a build phase. But then you want to be in a situation where, okay, how do we increase the stress without increasing the time? Because we don't have time. Well, that's where you can start playing around with the rest, bringing the rest down, building the duration out. But a general principle would be if you're a more endurance profile, how you get to your best performance is maximizing the aerobic system. You know, if we think of our our endurance profile example, we we brought up of your Sam Walsh, right? He's his role in the team is that we we want him to be able to run all day, yeah. right? And it's not just we want him to be able to run all day once; we want him to be able to do that every week. So we have to feed that. We have to flood that system for it to be sustainable for him to do that every week. But there are other players in the team. You know, if we're now talking about a Charlie Cameron, where if he tries to play that game of running 15K every game, then that's not sustainable for him, nor is that what we're trying to get from him as an athlete. So this is where the sport demand starts to you start to price that in into, okay, well, are we, how is that athlete getting to their best performance? Okay. If they're more endurance type, let's build out the endurance. If we're more speed type, we know that if we do longer reps at critical speed, it's going to get very anaerobic for them, yeah. Yeah. which means it's now not an aerobic stimulus. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the minute and clamp it, which that does two things. It, it minimizes the risk of it being harder than we want. And it also enables us to get the volume of critical speed we need to stimulate adaptation. And the moderate intensity critical speed work for speed profiles is really, for me, like the bread and butter of getting them fit. Because they have a lot more fast twitch muscle, you actually need a little bit of intensity to recruit some of that muscle. And we do want an element of adapt aerobic adaptation in that fast twitch muscle. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to repeat and recover. Now, some people might fear that, am I going to get slow by developing aerobic adaptation? And what I'd say is, well, if, if, if speed drops out the program, then, yeah, you put yourself at risk at that, right? Yeah. But if we know, okay, the gift that Charlie brings to the table is he's 10 meters a second speed, well, let's put some things in place, right? Let's have speed testing in every six weeks and let's have a, you know, bandwidth where we're comfortable with that dropping below, but no further. And we can adjust accordingly. So I think all of these things are about our speed and endurance in the program all the time. There's going to be light and shade. Sometimes you're building, sometimes you're maintaining. And then it's this dance of light and shade. And once critical speed reaches a high percentage of that MAS, so 90 to 95%, well, the body needs something different to adapt. We've moved the floor to the ceiling. Now we want to push the ceiling, which gives us room to move the critical speed into even more, right? And so training is just a cycle of this over time. But in order to do that and to not leave anyone behind, you have to know what your normals are and we have to be looking for what those are, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's um, starting to make a lot of sense in the way that you're framing it and going back to how you said with Jeff Bezos in terms of what's really important for that athlete and, and knowing the position that the athlete plays, yeah. the demands, what does the coach want from that athlete, but also... Yeah. You know, how's the athlete responding? What's their profile? And you just, you know, so within that, you've got your speed plan, that. Yeah, hybrid and endurance. Like let's say there's a speed um, athlete there that you've identified does need to improve their, you know, um, their critical speed uh, and speed endurance. So their, their fitness is starting to let them down um, for their mm. performance. Um, how would you tackle that in terms of, from a time perspective, for a speed athlete, is it? Am I right in thinking as long as they're maintaining the intensity at the right pace, 
you wouldn't play around too much with the rest period. You'd respect that for the speed athlete, but perhaps as they're adapting, you could increase the, the speed that they're moving at. Yeah, I think that's a good approach. What you're going to see as someone adapts is either the same speed with a lower perceptual and heart rate response. So let's say, just for argument's sake, let's say 16 kilometers an hour was our critical speed pace. We we might see, you know, in six weeks time that our perception of effort of that is now a three or a four out of 10. Adapting, yeah. uh, what I would rather see is a faster pace for the same response. Yeah, That's a scenario where if we started a session, you know, in rep two, rep three, we're seeing a three or four out of 10 effort and the heart rates, you know, 75% of um, heart rate max, I'd be saying, okay, we're not quite working hard enough. We've adapted to that now and we yeah. need to turn the dial up to keep us within this space. What if the reverse is happening and you're starting to think, oh, they're not adapting the way that you like and, and you're sort of getting a feel for the training group so you're not sure what the duration is yep. and how much time you need to, to stimulate them? I guess ultimately you just got to increase, is it a frequency that you start with that we're going to add an extra session in from one to two or more just start with volume, getting the volume prescription right within that session yeah, first? Yeah, you typically want you typically want two sessions a week. Once you start dropping below a frequency of like to like once a week, you're really you're barely maintaining the quality. That's yeah. the hard reality of yeah. the aerobic system. So you need two typically of twenty to forty minute sessions. Yeah. yeah. And so your speed your speed profiles like a good aim for them is to build them to a place where they can do that 35, 40 minutes a week. But hey, when you get to grand final stage, you know, you, you're you not going to be doing them as two sessions, but you might split that 40 minutes into, okay, with the added intensity and the emotion of all of that, what you might be doing is going, okay, we know 40 is our normal. We might try and do three tens throughout the week. So we're just trying to keep it rolling and moving through through the period. In a month out, the from, endurance, from, from exactly. The main, from the grand final, yep. From from the for the endurance profiles, though, we have to be really careful of pulling it back too much because that's the thing that enables their repeat and recover. Right, that's their real physiology strength. Because we don't, you know, in a game, Jack. Like, how much would, um, how many repeated efforts would you say players do? I think I saw something earlier that was like ninety eight repeated efforts in a game. I mean that sounded high, but maybe it is, right? Probably let's just, let's just play. Let's just, yeah, accelerations yeah. would be like anywhere between thirty and fifty, and D cells like yeah, you know, fifty to yeah, fifty seven. Right. So basically, a ton of those, right? So let's say, what's the benefit? Okay, so a good question would be, what's the benefit of doing more endurance type critical speed work? Well, for those players who are your, you know, your box to box, your Sam Walsh of the world, right? You want to be looking at, okay, rather than 50 to 60 repeated efforts can that be 80 to 90 because that's going to be crazy in what that can do for the team Might be able to stay often on the we're longer. going okay yeah, the, the often we're going here's one gps metric that we're optimizing towards and it's like well that's going to be about right for some not enough for others and so you don't actually maximize what you have within the team so that's the real opportunity here, right? Yeah. Let's price in as well now the, the sport-specific element because that is the game, right? Players have to be ready to play the game. Now, if players aren't playing a lot of match minutes, you're obviously going to index a bit more of the sport-specific physiology exposure into their individual conditioning, hmm. right? So you're going to have almost your let's say your subs or your players that play less minutes and then your players who play all four quarters, right? Um, but in terms of sport-specific conditioning, I think we've actually been taught wrong. In school, we've been taught energy system prescription. And there is a place for that. 
But as we talked about with the bank account analogy, if you're exposing people to the chemistry of the sport all the time, which you're going to be getting a sprinkles of that daily from the technical tactical work, right? So we need to price that in. Then, you know, you're just adding fatigue to the system all the time. All the time. And so I think there's a world here where let's say take a high speed running distance um, volume, like what would be a typical volume? Because I saw like some of the papers had different thresholds for what they consider high speed running. What would be most typical? At 19.8. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So in terms of total distance of high speed running in a game? Around oh, 800 to Two like two thousand would be elite. Like Sam Walsh would be anywhere between yeah. sixteen hundred and two thousand. Charlie Cameron might be five hundred to eight hundred as a guess. Uh, and then yeah. probably Brady Hill would be around your twelve thousand to fourteen hundred. I think they're, they're guessing. Yeah. I haven't seen any of the GPS reports. Well, let's, but, just, yeah. let's just pick two thousand. It's a nice round number, right? But that is the high end of what players are doing. Oh, that's your so, that's your top one percent, two thousand. Yeah. Probably a thousand is like standard. Yeah. Yeah. But a nice round number. Let's play with that. Yeah. So, you know, let's say that's the target. There's two things. If we are fitter because we've raised our critical speed higher, that means that the, a lot more of the low and moderate intensity of the game isn't costing us as much, right? Because we're in that steady state physiology. Could so that means speed. even without doing even without doing any more high speed running, we're increasing our capacity to do more. Mm -hmm. That's point number one. Point number two, if we maximize our sprinting speed, then we're increasing our ability to do that as well from an anaerobic speed reserve perspective. We know that if players are working at a lower percentage of their anaerobic speed reserve, so you can do that either by raising the MAS or raising the ceiling of sprinting speed, then you increase tolerance to high speed running. So there's two ways right there before we've even done any high intensity, that we can be improving players' capacity to do high-speed running. Then there's a third way, which often doesn't get talked about. This is, again, without the intent of a session prescription being physiology, anaerobic energy system focused. And that would be, if we say take 2,000 meters as a total game demand volume of high-speed running, there's a world here where we could be doing repetitions of 150, 200 meters at the external pace of that high speed running, but with open rest. And we might say, want to do to begin with, you know, between eight and 10 of those. And what that's allowing you to do is expose players to the mechanical cost of high-speed running, right? And the technique and form and build up the structural tolerance to handle that pace of running. But by capping the duration of that effort and having open rest, so that might be two to three minutes, you're taking away the heat of the physiology cost of that session. So then we can have a conversation about, okay, well, what makes the most sense here, right? We know that a 15, 20 second effort can become quite anaerobic. We know probably that if we're talking about speed profiles, they're probably gonna be at the lower end of the range of number of reps that we do. So we might say five or six is a good stimulus. We might say 100s actually helps us cap that rise in all the anaerobic physiology and enables us to get more volume of mechanical work at high speed running as opposed to, you know, two, three, four minute efforts, right? Which is going to be huge physiology chemistry. Whereas you might say for your, your more endurance profiles that maybe 
we can push that volume up. You know, they have the capacity to, rather than do 8 to 10, be getting 10 to 12. And as you move through a season, you're scaffolding the total volume of that every week. And quite quickly, you're building out the type of external work that you would be exposed to in a game demand without the same physiological cost, right? And you can do that at the same time as you're developing sprinting speed and critical speed. So if you're thinking, okay, how do I plan my week? Let's say, how, how long would you have on the pitch? Like 10, 15 minutes, something like that? Like not long, probably? Would that season, be? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, every yeah. club would probably be a bit different, but yeah, you got your warm ups. Yeah. And then... so, yeah. Yeah. So to me, like warm ups, you know, your emphasis there could be a critical speed pickup for the warm up jog. Mm hmm. You know, it could be some XL, D cell sprinting speed work. What would be the minimum time for to, to get a critical speed stimulus? Is that you mentioned ten minutes there with the speed athletes, like for your endurance? Is it twenty minutes or I think in a week you want to be getting them up towards like fifty minutes, fifty, 50 six yeah. minutes. Yeah. So so you could yeah. if you had four warm ups, you could do yeah, not that you would, but let's say ten minute slots and then and then do an extra cross training hit of 20 somewhere in there. And then you've got your 40 on yep. legs and 20. Yeah. 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 But I would think I would, you, because you have limited pitch conditioning time, I would yeah. spend that time on the faster stuff. Yeah. Right. I would spend it on the sport specific mechanics of high speed running, the sprinting speed when they're fresh, the acceler acceleration, deceleration. And what all this does, by the way, is just sets up a huge amount of scaffolding. For when you do say, oh, now is our key high intensity sport specific block where we are going to expose the players to more chemistry of, you know, let's say worst case scenario game demand, but they're all ready for it. They're mechanically ready for it. Their bank account is topped up and they're ready to go. As a consequence of doing that block of the work, they're not coming out the other side with a totally depleted bank account. So they get the fitness boost from doing it and they're not starting a zero. And then the job of the physical prep team is to spin the plates as you move through, right? To keep these things moving on. So um, how does it influence, say let's talk pre-season. So you got your sort of three big field sessions, you know, eight to 10 K uh, plus maybe a, a top up hill session on the weekend. If you were to do, and then your afternoon rotations is usually where Jim comes in and some more craft work and meetings and the like. If we, you, you would do your critical speed work um, away from the field session, uh, sort of in that afternoon rotation, does it matter that they've had a big on-leg session in the morning? Like obviously you just see how they respond in terms of heart rate percentage and, yeah. and their RPA and their breathing rate. If, if all those rules apply, you're still getting a good stimulus or do you need it? do you need to change things? I think the biggest thing you're managing there is the cumulative mechanical load across the week. Yeah. So I'm I'm not saying don't use the pitch for critical speed. It's an option. But I just think to get the physiology adaptation you want, that requires more time on feet. Mm. So, you know, one scenario and you know i've used this in return to play scenarios is like if you want to expose players to some on feet well maybe do the first 10 on feet and then have some bikes pitch side you know and do your top up there and get to your 20 minutes that way yep so yeah, i so think the mode mode doesn't matter as much as perhaps we think in terms of specificity don't have to be too specific with no, this mode generally yeah. speaking the training volumes in team speed. sport are far too low for anyone to be worried about. Is the modality going to give us an adaptation? Yeah. Right. We see, we see good adaptations from cross training in athletes doing a hundred kilometers a week. Mm -hmm. Right. So you guys don't have anything to worry about. Yeah. Right. It's not perfect, but it's going to, build the bank account in a way that is sustainable alongside the mechanical demands of the game. And that's the big piece that you're managing. Oh, hundred percent. 
like you said, it's sustainable. Yeah. It's something you can you can do over a consistent period yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in that, you know, the return to play application as well is massive. You know, how often do we end up in a scenario where, you know, we'll say, you know, pick pick a common injury you deal with, Jack. A hamstring or a few. Yeah. 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 So you might have a hamstring and then we have one way that we rehab a hamstring. Now, absolutely, medical should be in the lead with what goes on with an injury, right? They should be dictating here are the constraints of the injury. But if we're talking about a performance game demand of some players having to be at 15 Ks a game, then every day that we're not tapping into the aerobic system in some way, we are adding weeks on at the back end, right? So that's three or four weeks maybe that we're needing for conditioning before the can coach can the coach can have them available again. So I think this language of what's the spread of physiology within our group is really important for the whole team because you can have a conversation about, okay, what type of person are we rehabbing? What is the thing that makes them good? What is the thing that if we're not doing something about this from day one as soon as we can within and respecting the constraints of the injury, are we, you know, preparing people for the demands of what they're going back into? Because I see that often that there's sometimes can be, you know, with the right, with good intent, but it can end up sometimes as a medical cul-de-sac, right? And you need someone in that conversation who's looking at where's the adaptation? Are we keeping the aerobic system moving on? Because to give an example, you know, they did a, a good study in rowers that would have the spread of physiology we're kind of talking about in team sports, right? Some people with really massive engines and others that have big engines but also have that maximal peak power as well, right? Similar type of physiology. And they tested it before the Olympics at its peak and then they had eight weeks off. And then they retested everything. And they found that it took them double the time of the time off so eight weeks off but 16 weeks to regain their physiology back to the pre time off levels yeah. right <laughs> now there is now there is an element here of you know the more elite you become the longer you the more training years you have behind you the more elevated your physiology becomes, right? So it's got a higher ceiling to fall from, right? That is in play here. The more you lose. However, what it does highlight is, you know, we have to be really serious about that because the demands are not a joke and the repeat and recover cost on players is only going in one one direction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's um it's probably something that did spring to mind for myself. Like it it is something there's um Obviously, the time aspect of it, which I think we've we've tackled that aspect, and, and listeners that are looking mm. after high performance programs, um, the fact that the modes um, not everything that you can there is flexibility there. I think that makes it a lot easier from a practical point of view to fit it in with your week and fit it in perhaps yeah. and sell it to the athletes as as part of recovery as well as improving their performance. Yeah, um, yeah, so that and there is evidence it. for that, by the way. You know that the low intensity stuff can be really rejuvenating for the parasympathetic system. And so what you might find is, you know, there's a lot of like day one off, day two recovery as well. Yeah. Well, at the end of a end of a year, that's 100 to 150 training days. And that's a lot in mm. terms of the aerobic system. Mm. And maybe doing something low and moderate, day one post, kickstarts that recovery. And less people need that day two, case by case. But I think we're giving away a lot of training time for free. Yeah, yeah, state. definitely. Yeah, and I think that the in season for me seems um, really logical, and we've, we've we've discussed that. What about over, like, let's say exactly that? An AFL athlete typically will have you know be given three to four weeks where they get off, in, usually in October, uh, if if they're lucky enough to play in September, like the big dance in grand final, they they'll get October off, and then they start reloading again. 
Um, some mm. of them will, will only have two weeks and then they start doing their own program for a couple of weeks. But um, you sort of got your off season, which then preseason starts middle of November. So they might have an off season for six weeks of reconditioning. Where does critical speed typically fit with that when you're not seeing the athletes? And then over preseason, um, uh, how are you fitting in with your week with those, you know, four four field sessions um, where yeah. there's a lot of fatigue build up? Uh, do you sort of do it on your off days? Um, do you think, or yeah, where do you sort of fit it in from a time point of view? And and I guess engaging an athlete that's doing this type of work that is quite monotonous all year round, or do you sort of do it use it more sure. of a an in season, you know, to tape peak towards uh, grand final day sort of finals? Well, I think we we have to define some priorities in that decision making. So priority number one is, you know, when do we really want to be on in the season? Probably it's the first four weeks are important, like you want to start well. <laughs> the ladder position yep. helps. Uh, then, yep. you, you've, then you're sort of in that holding pattern of the week-to-week cycle. Um, yeah, and then ultimately you want to, uh, yeah, be pretty consistently performing well throughout the season, of course, to maintain yeah. good performance. And then finals, September finals, is where you really want to be at your best, for sure. So I think what you described there is, you know, there's obviously an initial piece that's important, but I think we want to be looking at every opportunity to have mini rebuilds built into our program. Mm. What does mini rebuilds mean? That's when we maybe take a step back from the amount of high intensity withdrawals we're doing with training from a conditioning standpoint. And we look at where we can rebuild the bank account, rebuild the scaffolding. Because if when you start pre-season, sorry, when you start the season, we're in game time now and we're hitting intensity and we're flying. It's like, yeah, that might work for four to six weeks, but then like that's not sustainable and the body needs something different. So we have to look at it and go, okay, well, we know that the tools at our disposal here are either to be building the bank account, making withdrawals. If we know where our normals are, we can navigate from those departure points. That's the most important thing then this becomes a game of judgment in the moment, right? Around what what game do we have come in? How long a window do we have? What's the recovery residual for this type of athlete, for that type of work? Are they endurance type? Are they speed type? And all those things come in to then go, okay, we'll go this way. And that's scary sometimes for people. But the reality of it is you know. You know the answer. You know the answer. As long as you have those things in place, right? You know the spread of your squad. You know the type of physiology that makes them good. Right? You know what things are going to be more high risk or low risk for that type of athlete. If we're worried about have we got too much intensity, well, you know that stacking more on is is high risk, right? That's more high risk. Um, So then you go, okay, well, maybe we go critical speed route. So I think you got to back yourself a bit. Yeah. You know, the principles are know the athlete profile, right? Know the spread of your squad. Do you have the right training items year round? So they are sprinting speed, acceleration, deceleration. They are your mechanics at high speed running. They are your critical speed and low intensity. There are going to be times where you go, yeah, now we're going to do a block of high intensity. So that might be, let's say, four weeks out from the start of the season, you might be talking about week three to go, week two to go, with maybe a bit of a taper week to rebuild into week one. That might be a two-week window where you go, okay, there, we're going to really hit four to five sessions of real intensity. Right? But if you're getting some of that intensity from the tactical technical. Do you need as much of it as we think we do? I think that's a really important reflective question for everyone. Because the building of the fitness can't stop just because the season started. 
and your main levers to do that as you move through the season are the lower moderate intensity. And the levers of moderate intensity are, well, have you built it recently? Because if you haven't, you just need to spend six weeks accumulating time. Right? Then you might go, okay, are we going to now try and increase the percentage of critical speed or build out the endurance of it? And the answer might be different if we're talking about, you know, um, if we're talking about Charlie Cameron or if we're talking about Sam Walsh, right? Your answer is going to be quite different. So you want to act on these principles, right? Because the map is not the territory, right? You're always going to have someone who presents that is different to the training model in the group. Okay, just seeing a question here from the uh, Instagram live. Do you want to read that out? Thank you, Cloud9 Endurance. On low intensity, Aaron, uh, yeah. Yep. yeah, on low intensity zone two under LT1, how much is too much for speed profile? What is the minimal dose for endurance profile? Would you do it only over off season, pre season? Question mark. Yeah, so to answer the last question first, no, I wouldn't only do it in off-season, pre-season, because that's a key part of building the bank account, right? So if you stop making deposits and your moderate intensity isn't controlled, you can suddenly find that you're not actually making deposits when you thought you were. That's the really dangerous place to end up in. Then you end up in a scenario where you go, oh, we thought the players were fit, because they'd done all this work, but they were working too hard, they weren't executing right, and it was all intensity. How much is too much for speed profile? Well, I think first thing, modality really matters. I would take them off feet, because when they express force, the recovery cost is really high for them. Right, So do everything you can to mechanically protect them. If you want... Um, better positions, like a cross trainer is a good option, right? Because at least you're still up tall. Olympical. Whereas in, it, yes, yeah. exactly. On, on, a, on a bike, you are going to get maybe a bit more hip flexor tightness, but what as about, long um, as you have the sort of corrective therapy in place, then that's not really a, really a problem. An uh, G machine, is that something that some pro clubs have yeah, used? Yeah, that too, but that that's still on feet, right, yeah. to a degree. Yeah. But yeah, you can you can use that to take the edge off, just harder on a bigger scale, of course, as well. Yeah. Um. So how much is too much? I think the mechanical bit is the main concern there, right? And the emphasis of it should feel easy. Mm. So it's typically going to be in that sort of seventy-ish percent of your max heart rate. If it's starting to creep up into eighties, then it's starting to be something else, right? It's starting to move towards critical speed. So this is where the execution matters. So you want to anchor it in an effort and a percentage of heart rate max. So typically around that 70%. What is the minimal dose for an endurance profile? So <clears throat> it's a good question and I'm not picking on you, but the minimal dose question I think is the wrong question. And here's why. The minimal dose question alludes that there is a number that is enough, right? We're going to arrive at a destination where we've done enough and we've got this adaptation. And it doesn't work like that. Your, your physiology is constantly in a state of flux. So I think uh, to tilt your question, I think where or how I think about it is, okay, if we know that an endurance profile gets there from maximizing their aerobic system. We want the maximal sustainable amount. So what does that mean? How do we get to that? Well, at the same time that we're building endurance, we have our speed. And as we talked about earlier, we're measuring where that is and we're happy where that is. And it's not deviating too far and we're not seeing sport specific work being affected then we can manage the duration component again off feet but typically endurance profiles are more comfortable on feet for the low intensity um 
in middle distance runners, which I use as a reference for physiology that is maximized, that needs both speed and endurance, in one session, you'd be getting up towards that 50 minute mark in one session. You know, I that, do 50, that 60. two sessions a week. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a long run for an endurance athlete would be, you know, up in that 90 minutes to two hours, but that's not realistic for team sports. You know, you got too many other variables going on. So I think just trying to drop it in when you can, because everything you can do, even if it's 20 to 30 minutes easy as a top up or a recovery, is adding to the bank account. So if we anchor in those measures of, you know, this would be a, you know, a three out of 10 effort and not climbing. If it starts climbing, it's becoming something else. Three out of 10 effort. Yeah. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know if you have any clarifying questions on that. Yeah, that were great. Question from great Angus questions. as well. The, um... See that one from Angus? Yeah. I'll pop that Thanks, one Angus. up on, on LinkedIn, on uh, YouTube. What are the... What are rest days, or why are rest days important? And should you do something on a yeah, designated rest day? Yeah, you need uh, to, some of this is self-regulation on the athlete side, right? Where we're talking about the principles of building a bank account. So if you're, if you've got a lot of stress in your life, let's say, as an example, that's going to deplete the bank account right? That might be nothing to do with what's going on with football, right? So we have to take an overall look at all of the stresses that we've got going on and be balancing the high intensity stress that is making withdrawals from the bank account in balance with making deposits. Obviously, Day after a game, if we're talking about what can we do to enhance recovery, you know, the basics of nutrition, sleep, and something that's not intense at all is, is what we're talking about. Now, if you're a profile that has a normal of, you know, let's say we're starting to accumulate over an hour of easy stuff a week just on cross-training, and we, we've got our critical speed up to 30, 40 minutes a week, we're in a place now where doing 20 to 30 minutes of very easy off feet the day after a game is not a stress to our body. And in fact, is more likely to be rejuvenating. So everything needs to be balanced against what you've done in the last six weeks as your normals. So our rest is rest important? Yes, 100%. Sometimes by doing something, you're going to accelerate the rest. But it's having it, everything needs to be in balance. Yeah, it's probably um, something that for the footballers listening in that want to get drafted, uh, which I know is a big one in our audience, so that they're peaking for their draft combine test, which is typically a yo-yo and a, and a 2K time trial. Um, mm. And often people, we you know, footballers, you'll, you'll slip into that habit of doing a big preseason and then playing and uh, you start to yeah, lose the habit of going to the gym and um, and doing any conditioning and, and leaving the game to keep you fit. And then you have about four to six weeks to get fit for the combine, um, which is all about speed, 20-meter sprint, an agility test, mm. um, and then obviously the jump as well. So it's all high-power yeah. activities, speed activities, and then the aerobic testing. Um, yeah. Yeah, do you think the, the critical speed aspect to help with their 2K time trial performance and yo-yo and, and ultimately to get a higher training output over the what they can handle throughout a week by doing that over their pre-season and, and in-season um, will have a big performance aspect, those tests. Yeah, 100%. I think, um, you know, something you mentioned earlier was that in-between time and what should people do. And I think, again, it's 
if we move too far away from these qualities, we detrain them. So we have to price in that some of that is going to happen a little bit in the off season and you should take that time to emotionally recharge as well, right? Because seasons are long and there is demand on players. You should take that time. However, you want to have good conversations with like your club about what expectations are for coming into preseason. You know, what kind of work do we want to be doing week one, week two of preseason and work back from there? You know, I think there is a world where you can start looking after a couple of weeks off around how you are starting to rebuild that bank account in the low and moderate space and then looking at the, you know, moderate and sprint speed end of things probably not tapping into the vo2 max and intensity that will come yep. right um and then the question around like rest before the combine or that kind of element for athletes on the call i think you really want to go on a path of understanding who you are and what makes you good right what are the sessions you enjoy what are the things that you seem to respond well to? Because then you can make better choices about, okay, when there is a crossroads of do I do this type of thing or this type of thing, you know, okay, well, my strength is I'm aerobically really strong. Maybe I benefit more from the critical speed, low intensity side of things. Right? So I think for athletes, you want to go on this path of actually owning the understanding of discovering what makes you good, you know? And I think that that's, that's an important piece here. Last one. And then obviously we'll, we'll start to wrap it up. I know it's nearly yeah, 90 minutes, good. Gareth, to, to yeah. uh, appreciate your time. The, we've, we've spent a fair amount of time on, on the missing aspect of conditioning, um, which is the critical speed. Mechanical mm. efficiency something you mentioned as well. Um, so what would a – I feel like we've got a good grasp now on, on how to facilitate a good critical speed program. What about mechanical efficiency? You mentioned it a little bit earlier, you know, um, an endurance athlete perhaps might do a 200 meter effort and then have a, mm. have a, you know, a good amount of rest. There was perhaps it was two minutes uh, and, you know, mm. a speed athlete might be a hundred meter duration. Um, so take us through a standard sort of program like your 16, 16, one minute on, one minute off for critical speed. What would a sort of mechanical efficiency program look like? Um, when you're starting yeah so i think you're you're if we if we're talking about what are the total types of training volume that you might want to get to you work back from what is your position demanding what is the coach asking from you so at the high end in high speed running that might be two thousand meters at the low end that might be a thousand meters let's say using the game as a as sort of yeah exactly yeah yeah and then you you maybe a, a good departure point is you know giving yourself a range i always prescribe in ranges right like six to ten of these depending on how they feel right and speed guys i'd be careful of it becoming too too long because it will become too anaerobic too fatiguing so maybe 100 meters is appropriate for you guys you can maybe push out a bit longer in the endurance group because you're not going to produce as high a lactate right and you just tend to get a bit more mechanically from uh, being at speed for longer yeah so I'd, yeah. I'd start there and then yeah you want the last one to look like the first one right and if that's not happening you've probably done too many or you've not done enough right if you're still feeling good that's when you know you can move on yeah okay yeah so the tech yeah. how so it, it really becomes really cool. yeah. it really becomes about execution yeah yeah so it might be for, for the speed athletes, six to 10 reps, 100 meters at like a 20 second sort of pace or, or 18 to 20 seconds, yep. let's say, yep. uh, on like the minute, two, two to one, or would you give them longer rest? No, 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 don't worry about the rest. When Just you feel good. Long, yeah, rest as long as you need. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, enough as you need. And this is where, you know, that skill of learning discipline of execution mm. is a really key part of being able to get to you know, high performance levels of training. So I'd be learning and focusing on developing that skill, checking the intent with your coach, executing that on, on the requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
No, very good. I really appreciate it, Gareth. It's um, certainly been a um, really engaging chat. I think um, I know speaking on, my, on behalf of myself, certainly have taken a lot of you know, three pages of notes. So hopefully listeners, uh, if you're not driving the car, listen to the recording. You've, you've got plenty of notes as well to take away from today's chat. Uh, if you tuned in halfway through or right at the end there, um, Gareth got straight into the good stuff. There's been gems all the way through, so make sure to listen uh, on YouTube channel. Um, this will also live on Gareth's Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, so make sure to give him a follow. In fact, if there's any follow-up questions, Gareth, where's the best place to, to connect, mate? I know you've got a website uh, and a newsletter yeah. that I'm subscribed to that's um, got a hell of a lot more information uh, and some great detail around some of the topics we discussed today. So, yeah, where's the best place to yeah, find Yeah, so the, the best place uh, would be garethsanford.com where you can find the free weekly newsletter so it does a deep dive on lots of these concepts every week 10 minute video in your inbox um that's the best place place to go and then yeah gareth underscore sanford on twitter instagram linkedin yep, well, added, taking yeah, the time in your questions yeah, great yeah. questions, and yeah, thanks everyone that's that's tuned in. Uh, we'll add the links that Gareth just mentioned all in the show notes as well. So if you are driving, you can click those once you park the car. Um, and uh, yeah, our next live chat will be with Shane McCurry, who's the Richmond Football Club Tigers uh, cultural leadership coach. So they'll be on the twenty fifth of April at four pm. So I look forward to seeing you guys then. Thanks again, Gareth. Really appreciate it, mate. Thanks, Jack. Great chatting. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in and those that uh, followed up after.